Things tend to happen in the garden or in the park. It's the way our biblical story begins in a garden, where it's green and lush and bursting with life, where every bird of the air and fish of the sea and every creeping creature on the earth is named, and where we are created in God's likeness and are commissioned to go forth and multiply and to fill the earth. But not everything goes according to plan in the garden, as we know, when we overreach or we take too much and our eyes are opened and we find ourselves for the first time outside. Things tend to happen in the garden or in a park. On the first day of the week, when it was still dark, Mary Magdalene goes to the garden, to the tomb, and when she sees that the stone is rolled away, she summons help from Peter and from the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And when they arrive and the sun is rising, linens become angels, a gardener becomes a savior. And when she hears her name uttered for the first time, the veil that separates life from death comes down. And the world is about to turn and life that was once taken is given back. And the powers that hung Jesus on the cross on Friday no longer hold sway, and Jesus has the last word and the first word on the first day of the week in a garden. Our cathedral sits nestled in a garden. It has stood there, that present building, uh, on the shoulders of previous buildings since 1805. And the garden is lush and green. It is a place of rest and refreshment uh, for dogs and walkers, uh, for local merchants and workers who sit on benches and have coffee or tea or lunch. Uh, it is a place for yoga instructors and their students with mats. It is a place for frisbee tossers and ball catchers and throwers. It is also a place where pilgrims can come and step into the cathedral and sit in silence and prayer or light a votive candle uh, for a love, for a loss, for a hope. Brides and grooms and photographers always will be found next to the war memorial taking pictures even though their nuptials were not performed in our chancel. And a peculiar thing often when you walk down around the corner, you will see tourists who will always stop at the edge of the cathedral and they will take their cameras or their, um, their phones and they will train the lens to the top of the spire all 316 feet. Uh, it was once the tallest edifice in Toronto, hard to imagine. And there they are inspired, but if they could just lower the lens down to the ground and trace a line across the foundation, they might see something different. Especially on the north or on the east side, in the crevices near the buttresses, you might just see cardboard and you might see sleeping bags or makeshift tents and ordinary men and women who are running away from the world or finding a protective place in the shadow of the cathedral. And you will find them there sometimes in the winter, in the summer, or in the spring and the fall. There was one woman, I will call her Dora. And Dora, who is my age, slept every single night on our front porch through the winter. And try as we might to try and get her proper housing and working with her housing worker and coaxing her, she would not leave. And every morning she would bundle up her things in two bundle buggies. She'd step into the cathedral to warm up. And every night she would go back out um, and she would sleep. And often she was not alone. She would be joined by two and three and five and six people all the way through the night and we would worry whether or not they would rise in the morning. Dora departed from our stoop sometime in the spring and we missed her and then we started worrying about her and other workers on the streets did too and so we put out a missing persons uh, report. And then a few days later she showed up on our doorstep again and we said we have been worried sick about you 
and she said, I was just away. <laughs> She's away again. When the buttresses on the north and east side of the cathedral are not being literally used as latrines, they are used for hiding a stash. And there are many who use by the buttresses of our cathedral. Ordinary men and women, brothers and sisters and daughters and sons and parents who have somehow lost their way in the park and behind them a long trail of used syringes. Over the course of this last spring and summer, our sexton started picking up more and more used syringes, sometimes as many as a hundred in a month. And we knew that we needed to do something different in the face of so much pain. For 23 years, the cathedral has been operating a drop-in that takes place in Snell Hall on Tuesday afternoons between 1.30 and 3.30, serving a hot meal. 10,000 meals have been served this year. Free haircuts, counseling, a friendly face where you are named an opportunity to do Bible study uh, and just to get your feet checked and your health um, upheld. But we also know that in the face of so much pain, more needs to happen. Never, ever, ever underestimate the power of a parish nurse named Lanity Lampman. <laughs> Nor of an outreach worker named Kathy Biazzi nor of courageous sextons or clergy who are willing to go into the park and form relationships, check a pulse, break up fights, and stand by and just wait for something to happen. It took a little work and a lot of tenacity, but you will find now in the park a box that stands about yay high. It is bright yellow. It looks like a post office box. Uh, you can see it from every direction in the park. It's actually a Sharps container. And it's a reminder to dog walkers and those who find rest and play in the park that there is harm, but there's also a reminder to those who are addicted that we know that you know that we know that you know that we know. <laughs> and we want to help you find comfort out of harm, out of pain, and to become clean. We also, uh, many of us, have been trained how to use a naloxone kit. Many who are uh, sextons and clergy and vo ordinary volunteers to look for the signs of overdose. We have lost one friend in the park this summer. Another was revived and we have called the EMS many, 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 many times. But we also know that there's some place we're called to go even deeper than that. On Church Street, there are three spires that you can see within just a couple of blocks. A United Church, a Catholic, and an Anglican. Sounds like the beginning of a terrible joke. <laughs> an Anglican and a Catholic and um, a United Church member go into a bar and the bartender looks at them and says, I never expected to see the three of you together. For centuries now, we have been working mostly apart and doing very good work of serving the needs of those who are poor. But something is happening for us. And we recognize, actually, we are stronger together. And so a small group from those three congregations, as well as a few folks from St. Mike's Hospital and Sisters of St. Joseph's, uh, along with some staff and professors from Ryerson University have for the last two years been intentionally listening unto how we can work together to go deeper with those who wish to change their lives. We have learned how to listen to those who have lived experience, those who have been working on the front lines, but also to learn and carefully listen to how we as people of the gospel so often retreat into our own denominational ways. And as we've listened, what we've heard is to create circles of support like a hub, like the hub that holds the wheel to the axle and the axle to the chassis, where a group will come together and walk with one person who is needing, wanting, desiring to make deep changes in life, 
not to chastise, not to preach, but simply to bear witness. So the best way to get churches to work together is to pony up. So we each put in two grand this year, 5,000 next year. We've written a curriculum and starting in February, the Faith Hub will launch two small groups. A participant from each of the communities will walk with one person who uh, has walked on the streets for many, many months and or years. Not for one month, not for two, but for a year or 18 months. And six months from now to um, start another group, not to divide, but to multiply. Two groups, four groups, eight groups, 24 groups. Pray for us. Pray for us at the corner as we begin this work together. And if you are interested in being a participant, somebody to bear witness and to go deeper, talk to me. Thank you.